and it's my pleasure to call now um, Miriam Merad for the next talk. So Miriam is a professor of cancer immunology at the Mount Sinai Medical School in New York City. And I think to continue on myeloid cells and discuss myeloid cells in the context of cancer, there is nobody else we could thought uh, to invite to talk about it. So your title is Myeloid Cell Control and Anti-Tumor Immunity. Right, well, thank you very much, Alain and Hugues, for the invitation to uh, lecture here today. I'm very honored to be in this very historical place. In fact, my mother was very proud of me, so thank you also for this. Um, and uh, I'd like to congratulate also my French colleague for the results of the, the, the presidential election. We were quite scared about what was going to happen. I will also, however, urge you not to underestimate the um, uh, really destructive power of this populist movement, because even when they are in, and even if they are kicked out quite fast, they have very long-lasting damage and, uh, in, in society, as we are seeing now in the US. So keep fighting, especially the young generation. Use your data-driven mind and make sure they never come into power, because they stand against everything the Collège de France stands for. So uh, today I'll be talking about myeloid program that, that modulate tumor immunity. But before, uh, <clears throat> I'd like to really emphasize uh, really this, this, I think, realization that, that uh, really um, you know, came in, in this recent decade that, that really immune cells are part of all human disease lesions. And, and they probably contribute to modulating the outcome of disease beyond you know, the one that are driven by dysregulation of the immune system, such as autoimmunity or inflammatory disease. So we know that, the immune, that this inflammatory component plays a very key role, for example, in atherosclerosis or, 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 or uh, myocardic infarction or uh, metabolic syndrome, but also uh, during aging. And, and really the biggest uh, uh, revolution, I would say, in the last decade is the realization that drugging the immune system can be curative. And we've seen that, for example, of course, with vaccine that stopped the pandemics, but also with this checkpoint blockade that are transforming the outcome of, uh, of, of advanced cancer uh, disease, as I'm going to talk about today. Um, and, uh, and also this uh, explosion of anti-cytokine blockade that are modulating the outcome of many diseases uh, beyond inflammatory bowel disease and rheumatoid arthritis. And, uh, and really, I think it's possible now to really group the disease into most human disease into these two groups, those that are associated with an overactivation of the immune system and those that are associated with the suppression of the immune system. And the cancer would be in this group where the immune system or the, 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 the immune response is really dampened. So the moonshot challenge, I believe, in, in the years to come is really to learn how to control harmful inflammation without compromising the immune systems to fight pathogen and, and eliminate tumor. And specifically for our purpose today in, in cancer is to learn how to enhance tumor immunity without inducing harmful inflammation. And to do that, it's going to be very important to map the cellular and molecular program that are responsible for this immune imbalance really, that is present in most, in most human lesions, and, and understand how this program respond to treatment can really transform our understanding both of disease pathophysiology, but also enhance our drug discovery effort. So really to fill this gap of knowledge, we build a human experimental platform, which we now call the Neoadjuvant Research Group to evaluate therapeutics or target, which is a multidisciplinary group where we, be, we bring cancer immunologists, uh, we surgical oncologists, pathologists, and uh, interventional radiologists and radiologists. And, uh, and this group uh, really identify the, the lesions that needs to be really mapped, uh, mapped using this explosion of technology that Ido introduced uh, for us today. And, uh, and which is which coalesced in a platform that I founded in, in more than 10 years ago, and I now co lead with my, my colleague um, Sasha Niatik. And together, we really identify relevant tissue pipeline that, uh, uh, that can be mapped and relevant technology to map really this complexity of uh, the, the complex immune network that is present in disease lesions. 
So we are, this immune monitoring platform is now part of a, a cancer moonshot initiative, which is funded by the NCI to uh, monitor, in fact, immune, monitor, immune immunotherapy trials or combination trials. So it's funded by uh, uh, this cancer moonshot uh, through the, the NCI, but that recently there is a big consortium of industry that is now matching the NCI fund. So it's, it's, a, it's a great tool that we need to embrace really to, to build this type of framework, which I realize is, is very similar to what Ido uh, uh, introduced, which is really uh, learn as much as possible uh, uh, from from patients, but then in order to build hypothesis, and the hypothesis would need to be probed, of course, added in experimental model, whether it is animal models or, or organoid or, or, or uh, ex vivo type of, of studies. And then the idea is to probe the pathway in this model, but then go back to the patients and use again this ability to map the lesions and, and do this in an iterative manner. And this is what we call this adaptive clinical trial platform, which is really a new way of doing uh, uh, medicine, and this is this will can, can be done at, on a small scale in patients, so that we can de-risk these large phase three trials, which we know uh, fairly in excess, in fact, and and at, a, at an enormous cost burden for for the pharmaceutical industry, but also for patients. All right, so now I'm going to give an example of a study that we've done recently. These are unpublished studies where we leveraged a, 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 a neoadjuvant. Maybe I didn't emphasize so much that the, 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 the neoadjuvant research group, I, I should have emphasized that the, the goal is to really harness the pre-surgical setting. So a setting where we will study lesions prior to surgery and use that type of, uh, that, that, uh, uh, that setting, that disease setting, to really uh, uh, map molecular response to treatment. And that allows us to really reduce confounding variable because the, the, the lesions are treatment naive, so they have not been bombarded with, with, with treatment. But also maximize tissue access because we will have access to surgical lesions uh, and uh, after exposure to defined period of treatment. So this is what this target focuses on, on this uh, pre-surgical setting. And here we leverage a neoadjuvant trial that we've done recently on patients with early hepatocellular carcinoma that were treated with two doses of PD-1 blockade. This PD-1 blockade was made by Regeneron. This study is funded by Regeneron. In fact, it would have not been possible to be done even with the, all this funding from the NCI because the, uh, uh, really mapping extensively is a, uh, these lesions is extremely costly. So the pharma needs to step up. In fact, they have been stepping stepping up you know, quite significantly, and I'd like to thank them for that. Uh, so this is a, a, a study where we, they, we received two PD-1 blockade made by Regeneron. It's called semi, semiplimab. And uh, uh, tissue are collected prior and after two doses of PD-1 blockade and uh, uh, profile with different technologies that I will introduce. Uh, this study, uh, so the, the trial was published recently. Uh, with, with quite good response rate. HCC is a very serious disease, uh, <clears throat> and uh, all of the treatment have never exceeded something like between 5 to 7% response rate. Here we, uh, uh, in this very small cohort of patients, uh, the, the, the response is measured at the, at the histological level. So it's, it's, it's unclear how it correlates with clinical responses. But at the histological uh, level, 30%, approximately 30%, a third of the patients responded to these two doses of PD-1 blockade. And this enables us then to compare, in fact, the molecular pathway that are associated with response and, and those that are associated with resistance to treatment. And this study was done by two fantastic uh, postdoctoral fellows in my lab, Asaf Majen, who is a computational biologist, and Pauline Hamon, a French student who was trained in Institut Gustave Roussy, in, in, in La Pitié d'un Institut Gustave Roussy, Pauline Hamon. All right, so the first things we've done is to look at the T cell infiltration pattern in these tumor lesions. And, uh, and we thought the HCC is really the prototype of inflammatory, uh, of inflammation driven cancer. So we thought that most of the lesions will be really heavily infiltrated with T cells, and this was not the case. In fact, we identified the three patterns that were described in many tumors, including melanoma lesions. Uh, where we see a, a, a group of, uh, of, of uh, tumors that are heavily uh, uh, enriched with T cells, some where T cells are excluded <coughs> and they are stuck in this uh, uh, stromal compartment, and some uh, lesions that are really depleted of T cells. 
Okay, so then uh, we've looked at how these, you know, stratified according to response to PD-1 blockade. And what we saw is that while all responders were enriched with T-cell, there was a large subset of non-responders that were also uh, uh, quite what people call inflamed. I'm not sure it's, it's a good term because inflamed means immune cells, where here we, we really refer to T-cells. A large subset of T-cell rich lesions also failed to respond to PD-1 blockade. You can see this here. Although the, the, the number of T cells seems to be high in the responders, a high uh, uh, number of T cells were also infiltrating the non responsive lesions. So now, because the immunological mechanism that leads to these different T cells patterns is distinct, what we decided to do is to really focus on these T cell rich lesions and understand why some uh, patients will respond to treatment and some do not. Okay, so, <clears throat> so first I'm showing you here that. It, uh, that the, the tumor mutation burden, in fact, just the burden, so the quantity of mutation didn't seem to differ between responders and non-responders. There are no major differences. There is a, a difference in potentially in, in, in some of, of on the, the, the type of mutations. So there is, for example, an accumulation of this beta-catenin activation, activating mutation in the T-cell low lesions that fail to respond to treatment. As was shown, in fact, uh, in melanoma patients and other tumors, that was quite clear. There is also an abundance of p53 mutation in uh, the T-cell rich responders, and this is something we are seeing also in, um, uh, in lung cancer lesions. But otherwise, in terms of burden, there is no big difference across uh, uh, responders and non-responders. When we now look at the clonal expansion of T-cells, now I'm I'm, I'm going to focus on T-cell rich responders and non-responders. There, no, there is, in both cases, quite a good clonal expansion of T-cells, although the, the expansion is higher in responders compared to the uh, T-cell rich non-responders, and of course, compared to the lower excluded uh, lesions. So now we look at, uh, we are going to look at the phenotype of these T cells that expand in these patients. And, uh, and the first things we did is look at the phenotype of the T cells that are present in the tumor lesions compared to the adjacent tissue. Forget about response for a minute here. And what we saw is that there is an accumulation, as was shown in many other studies, of PD-1 high T cells in, in the tumor. So suggesting that this PD-1 uh, uh, pathway is really driven by tumor cues. This is what you are seeing here. The PD-1 high uh, uh, accumulate in the tumor compared to the adjacent tissue. And we saw four different programs that are accumulate uh, within this PD-1 high compartment. Uh, which include a, a program that is in line with this terminally exhausted uh, program, which include high level of, of tox, PD-1, CTLA-4, and low level of cytotoxic genes. There is a program that is associated with or have been described as progenitor exhausted, which are also called TPEX, uh, to express high level of uh, uh, TCF7 and XCL1 program of proliferating T-cells expressing high level of Chi67 and uh, effector T-cell program with high level of granzyme and low level of tox. So now we are going to look at how this program stratify across responses and what we saw... Oh, I did something uh, not so good here. And what we saw is that there was a, a, really an abundance of effector T-cells in the responders compared to non-responders, even non-responder rich, uh, T-cell rich lesions. Right? This is really dominate in, uh, in the responder patients. Uh, <clears throat> then we uh, look at now CD4, the CD4 T-cell compartment. Sorry, did I mention that this was CD8? This is mostly CD8 T-cells, right? So now we are going to look at the CD4 T-cell compartment. Should I mention that this is single cell uh, sequencing? I don't even have to mention this, people now. It's a commodity now, the single cell uh, profiling. All right, so now I'm going to focus on CD4. And when we look at CD4 program, uh, <coughs> we also uh, do the same thing. First, we look at what uh, accumulate in the tumor compared to adjacent tissue. And what we saw is that these T cells with T follicular helper features accumulate quite significantly in the tumor compared to adjacent. And these cells express high level of PD-1, but also high level of CXCL13, as introduced by Ido in, uh, a minute ago, high level of IL-21, high level of ICOS, CD200, and IL-6 uh, uh, signal transducing uh, uh, pathway. Uh, so this suggests that it has some type of follicular helper uh, uh, um, uh, program. 
There are other features that I'll, I'll get uh, uh, back to in, in, at, by the end of the talk, including this expression of the succysterol gradients, or CH25H, which was shown to play a key role in organizing, uh, 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 organizing cells in, in infoid organs. All right, so now we are going to look at how this program, so here, I showed you there are, of course, many other programs, including some TH1 or TH17 T cells, and we are looking at how these programs stratify across uh, adjacent, uh, across responder and non-responders. And what we saw is that the program that dominates in responders is this TFH or CXCL13 T helper cells. You know, we hesitate in how to call them, so it's, uh, <clears throat> and, uh, and we are going to call them CXCL13 positive cells accumulate in responders compared to non-responders, whether in the non-responder T-cell rich, there is maybe a domination of T-reg. Definitely, in terms of ratio, there are more, much more T-regs, T-regs versus CFH in the T-cell rich compared to the T-cell rich responders. So these are the two compartments that we really accumulate in the responder and non-responders. Now, when we look at this program, which was very, very unique and very crisp, this TFH program, we've looked whether it's present in other uh, uh, tumor data sets that we generated in the lab or that were publicly uh, available, and we see this program you know, present across many tumors. So it seems that this TFH-like uh, cells are really uh, accumulate at, at the tumor site across many uh, tumor lesions. So next, we looked at whether this effector T cells also correlate with the TFH. Indeed, there was a very strong correlation, not surprisingly, of these TFH cells, TFH-like cells, and CD8 effector T cells. In, uh, um, they correlate, and of course, they correlate even uh, more so in, in responder patients. So these are the two programs of T cells that, uh, that dominate uh, the, the tumor lesions in responder patients. Now, when we look at the exp whether this program, you know, there was, they, they were clonally expanded. So here we use a single cell TCR sequencing, and here we sequence more than one million T cells. And this is why I was mentioning the importance of pharmaceutical industry funding, because these are very, very expensive studies. What we see is that indeed, you know, in both in this effector and TFH-like program, there is significant clonal expansion. And there is clonal expansion, you can see it here, both in responder and non-responder. However, the clone, the clone size uh, uh, in responders was, uh, uh, was somehow higher, but there is still some expansion also in the non-responders. So now we are going to focus on, uh, on this TCR as a molecular barcode to really look at uh, the, the type of molecular program within one antigen-specific T cell compartment now at the tumor site. And when we gate on this TCR, so here we are going to gate on each bar is, is a clone, and we are going to look at uh, the type of program. I'm just looking at the tumor site here. We look at the program that accumulates within one uh, a clone, and what we saw is that there is often this four program within one clone at the tumor site, suggesting that there was you know, this pro pro progenitors proliferating, uh, effector T cells and terminally different T cells, suggesting that there was this differentiation occurred likely locally, right, at the tumor site. Now, when you look at the trajectory of, of differentiation in responder and non-responder, you can see that here there is uh, an enrichment of terminally differentiated cells, which we believe are not very good at killing tumor cells, whereas here there is an accumulation of effector T cells, which are probably quite potent at eliminating tumor cells. But there is something, uh, another interesting point here is that we also saw that there was these progenitor T cells in the non-responder uh, lesions. And that was a little bit surprising to us because it's been suggested that, these, uh, uh, that the lack of responses may be due to the lack of, non, of, of progenitor T cells, that these progenitor T cells are not present in the lesions, and indeed, in fact, they are. They are here, but it seems that they are not really differentiating properly. Okay, so then we were quite intrigued about the fact uh, that, that these T cells were probably proliferating at the tumor site, because we saw this, this, uh, uh, this differentiation trajectory at the tumor lesion. So what we did is we then designed probes uh, to stain for the TCR of the most abundant T cell clones you know, after treatment. And, uh, and we've designed several probes for CD8 TCR, TCR clone or CD4 clones. And then we went back, and this is what I'm showing you here. These are the clones post-treatment um, of CD8 and, and CD4. And then we looked for them and, uh, prior to treatment. And what we saw is that all these clones were in fact present already prior to treatment. They were sparse 
but they were there. And uh, uh, so that was, uh, uh, again, <coughs> suggesting that there was much uh, uh, local proliferation and there was reactivation at the tumor site. Then what we also did is we then used bulk seek. The problem with uh, uh, tissue prior to treatment is we have very little access to tissue. And this is something that we need to think about, at least with our interventional radiology colleagues. How can we really uh, expand this culture of, of biopsy you know, in, in HCC in particular because the diagnosis is made by imaging. So there is no, there is no need for, for biopsy. And it's done only in the context of clinical trials. And patients can refuse, in fact, to undergo tissue, uh, uh, tumor biopsy. So it was very difficult to obtain material prior to treatment. And you had access to very little, small piece of material, because then you have to negotiate with pathologists, you know, access to, to, to tissue. So despite that, what we found when we use bulk seek and now look at you know, just a, a beta chain, right, this, uh, 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 just comparing this uh, uh, clone, the presence of, of clone, not at the sequence level, uh, in, in prior and post-treatment, what we saw is that 75% of the clones that we identify post-treatment were already present prior to, prior to treatment at the tumor site. When we look at the clones uh, present in the tumor versus blood or tumor versus lymph node, there was much less matching between the two compartments. And when we done this, this what we call this Gini index to really look at uh, the, the expansion of uh, uh, clone pre-post treatment at the tumor site or, or uh, post treatment between the tumor versus lymph node or tumor versus blood, what we, what we saw is that the biggest difference between responder and non-responders is the ability to expand T cells at the tumor site and not really in the lymph node. There are probably many caveats for this, but I just wanted to brainstorm these results with you. Uh, so it seems that really this ability to reactivate locally is correlate with response to checkpoint blockade. <clears throat> so, so what I've showed you is that at least many T cells expand locally upon exposure to PD-1 blockade. And this really prompted our search for local cues that really promote the expansion of these effector T cells in responders. <clears throat> so, so this is when I'm going to talk about myeloid cells. Uh, <clears throat> so, so we, so we've been studying uh, myeloid cells also for, for, for many years uh, with a strong focus on dendritic cells and, and macrophages which are uh, really the two myeloid compartments that, that educate T-cell uh, response, right? T-cells cannot respond without being educated by this uh, APC compartment that will really instruct their effector or regulatory program. Now, <clears throat> we have shown that dendritic cells, there is several subsets of disease, uh, and in, in, in normal tissue, in the absence of inflammation, this is the, the lineage of dendritic cells that dominate, uh, which are called conventional dendritic cells. They derive from DC restricted precursors that originate in the bone marrow. There is two subsets of DC, DC1 and 2. This compartment in particular seems to be uh, uh, quite potent at cross-presentation. It cross-presents extracellular material and, uh, uh, and has uh, our focus on, on this subset of dendritic cells in, in tumor immunity or antiviral immunity, which is the only compartment that really can cross-present either virally infected cells or tumor cells, cell associated an antigen to T cells. And then there is another compartment of, of uh, uh, DC that DC like cells, we argue, that derive from these monocyte uh, cells that, that really um, are mobilized mostly in inflamed lesions. So recently we showed that um, these dendritic cells, mostly DC1 and DC2, which have been shown to be very potent At, at priming, in fact, and specific T cells, we showed that uh, these dendritic cells undergo a molecular state when they capture, potentially capture, a cell-associated antigen. And they undergo this uh, molecular transformation, which we called MREG. So this is what I'm showing you here. We found that dendritic cells, both DC1 and DC2, open capture of cell-associated antigen. Here we profiled at the single cell level cells that have captured tumor antigen. This was done in the mouse, but also in human. And, uh, and we look at, at you know, the, the, uh, the, the, the molecular program that is associated upon capture of cell-associated material. And what we saw is that this DC uh, undergo a maturation process that leads to a very strong upregulation of maturation molecules that are very potent at, at, at uh, activating a T cell program, but also very strong upregulation of regulatory molecules with a very high expression of PDL1 and PDL2. 
very uh, high expression of the SOX protein that limit in fight cytokine signaling, a higher regulation of migratory molecule, including expression of CCR7 and fashion, but also a strong down regulation of toll like receptor, as if when the cells eat, they need to you know, stop sensing damage anymore. What's interesting is that while they upregulate this toll like receptor, they also down, uh, sorry, down regulate toll like receptor, they also down regulate antigen receptor, they also upregulate FAS, and FAS is the best way for dendritic cells to, to die. They die usually through this fast, fast vegan induced pathway, and, and the signal of that is really provided by activated T cells, and usually this is much stronger when, when they really engage at the antigen-specific level. So this is a program uh, that suggests that this is a program where DC is interacting with T cells, right? And, and by focusing on, on, on this program, it's, it's important to really uh, potentially probe the, the, the pathways that are most relevant for T cell regulation or T cell activation. So, uh, so we call these cells MREG. These names can change for maturation uh, and regulatory and rich dendritic cells. And we've looked for this program in many tumor lesions. And in fact, this same program, was, we, we described it in lung uh, tissue a few years ago, but was also described recently in HCC lesions, which is the focus of my talk today, by Ziming Zen. He calls them LAMP3 positive DC, because uh, they, the, this LAMP3, which in fact quite used by, by pathologists to look for activated DC for a long time, these LAMP3 are really most abundant in this program. It really suggests that this is redefining really this very mature DC that have captured uh, a cellular, uh, an antigen cargo. So we also looked for this program in many tumors, and in fact, so the same program exists in most of the, tumor, the tumor you look at, we suggesting that in this tumor, DC are indeed constantly taking this tumor antigen. But the reason why I suggest it's important to look at it is by, by looking at this, you, you reduce the diversion of other DC program, and you start focusing on these programs that are interacting with T cells. So we also uh, <coughs> used uh, recently this Visium technology, which is uh, uh, developed also by 10X, to uh, capture mRNA you know, at, at the spatial level. And then we uh, projected this MREG program you know, at, 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 the, uh, at the tumor site to look at the spatial distribution of this MREG uh, molecular compartment molecular that define, you know, that's that active cell, uh, uh, dendritic cells compartment. So here the tumor was annotated by a uh, pathologist because we cannot obtain single cell resolution. So the pathologist is going to annotate the different region of the tumor. So for example, this is a, a tertiary lymphoid structure, which are lymphoid aggregates that are uh, often present. This is an HCC lesion, so quite common in HCC lesions. Also, uh, uh, the, the, this is the tumor, uh, uh, tumor compartment or the stromal compartment. Then we are going to look at where this MREG program dominates. And what we saw is that this MREG seems to dominate in the, in the core of the tertiary lymphoid structure. Uh, in and, and, and this is in, uh, uh, in association with this activated B cell compartment and activated T cells. And the MREG seems to be really de enriched in the rest of the tumor lesion. So it suggests that really it is associated in, the, or it is abundant in this lymphoid aggregate. Now, together with, uh, uh, we had two slides in common, Ido, today, the, the program and, and this slide. And, and, the, and this is a beautiful study that we've done uh, in collaboration with the Ido Amid's group through this uh, extraordinary fellow, Mehav Cohen, uh, who developed, while in Ido's lab, this technology of, of sequencing physically interacting cells. So the question we ask with, with Mehav and Ido is, if indeed the, the DSM-REC pro, uh, program are, are engaged with T-cells, uh, can we use these uh, physically interacting cells, seek meta to really uh, uh, understand the program of DC that are interacting with T cells at the tumor site. So this study was done on human uh, non-small cell lung cancer lesions, where uh, uh, Merav, in my lab, used this uh, uh, slide digestion uh, uh, method that she developed in Ido's lab, purify now uh, uh, doublet cells, so specifically DC interacting with T cells, and then brought them uh, to the Marsic platform and sequenced them in Ido's group. 
And, uh, and what we saw indeed, as, as Ido mentioned, is that uh, uh, first the DC that were interacting with T cells, where is indeed in this MREX state. So they are, uh, DC when interacting with T cells had this molecular program. But what we also saw is that the T cells that were interacting with MREG were in this state that uh, I described earlier. They had very similar program, these TFH-like cells that we saw dominating in the responder uh, patients. So now we are trying to do the same uh, study in HCC. Quite difficult to do it in the context of a clinical trial, I have to say, because to uh, do this uh, uh, fact sorting, we need to fact sort these doublet cells. You need to use a lot of material, and that's not always easy because we have to use material for many other uh, assay. But it seems that we probably are obtaining the same results. So first, when we look at untreated lesions, we see indeed that in this uh, physically interacting cell, there is a domination of this MREG program and TFH-like cells in HCC lesions. Now, we've done one responder and one non-responder. And in this responder, it, it, there is also an act. It seems that there is a higher number of MREG interacting with TFH-like cells, whereas in the non-responder, we didn't see an enrichment of these doublet cells. That was quite exciting to us. So we went back now and used multiplex imaging to see whether we can identify these niches of MREG interacting with TFH cells. And what we saw was really quite fascinating. So what we saw is that there was indeed niches in, in these lesions. But in this niche of MREG, uh, so MREG now is um, um, characterized by this uh, uh, molecule, DC lamp or LAMP3. <coughs> uh, this lamp is the protein that's coded by LAMP3 gene. And uh, uh, this uh, lamp positive cells accumulate close to the CXCL13 positive uh, uh, T cells. But we also saw the presence of these TS TCF1 CDA T cells. Now, these are the progenitor T cells that, uh, that uh, were shown to be important for re that, that respond the, the, the most to, to PD1 blockade. So, in this niche, what we saw is progenitor T cells, CFH like cells, and the MREG cells. So then we went back and tried to really uh, 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 see whether these T cells were indeed also uh, expressing uh, IL-21 and, and this oxysterol gradient that we became very interested in. So here we use uh, uh, FISH or RNA FISH where we designed the probe for uh, IL-21 and CH25 and look whether in this niche these T cells were producing this molecule and indeed there was an abundance of IL-21 and, uh, uh, and, and CH25H in this niche that I just just described to you. Uh, and then we've, did, we've done what we call proximity uh, analysis, um, uh, uh, and, and this is quite blurry. So, so what we see is like the proximity of these DC, uh, MREG DC with different programs, and what we saw is that these MREG indeed were uh, close to progenitor CD8, uh, and uh, sorry, were close to progenitor CD8 and uh, uh, these TFH-like cells. Uh, we then look whether they were close to effector T cells, but what you, we found is that it seems that the effector T cells are not accumulated, accumulating in this niche. In fact, there are. Uh, leaving the niche and probably going and invading the tumor lesions. And this is what we uh, see here, is that uh, in the responder, there is a proximity with progenitor CD8. There is no uh, proximity with the effector. The effectors are leaving the niche and probably going to their tumor target. Uh, <clears throat> so then we've used uh, this receptor ligand analysis to uh, uh, understand the, the, the type of uh, program that may be responsible for building this niche or, or potentially also uh, instructing this T-cell program. And I have to say in this niche, there is very interesting molecule. So for uh, companies that are uh, interested in modulating, uh, uh, activating regular pathway, this is a very interesting list of genes to, to focus on. So for example, we saw that this MREG DC expressed very high level of T cell molecule, T cell chemokine. Uh, I may have to stop now. Alan, you, you stop me huh, if I'm too long. Uh, <clears throat> including um, uh, chemokine that recruit CXCS3 uh, 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 T cells, but also a lot of molecules uh, uh, that recruit all the CCR4 positive T cells. You know, so this MREG DC express very high level of 17 and 22. In fact, we saw it in the mouse. It's the same in human. It's the same everywhere they are. So 17, 22, which are the, the ligand for CCR4, but also express very high level of CCL19, which recruit uh, uh, CCR7 express on both naive, but also central memory T cells. They also express a very high level of co-simulatory molecule, including this uh, PVR and PVRL2, which is now quite uh, uh, exciting for the field. 
because they engage this molecule called CD226, uh, which is inhibited by TG8, which seems to also be a very strong activator of T cell effector program. But they also express very high level of uh, inhibitory molecules. So PDL1 and PDL2 and many other, in fact, regulatory molecules are abundant in this MREC program because there is always this balance of, of regulating when you activate uh, uh, when, when you activate any immune cells, in fact. Uh, and what we saw also that these DCs express also very important cytokines for T cell uh, 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 activation. So express IL-15. Uh, uh, they express also uh, IL-12. And this is, I think, my last uh, uh, set of molecules showing that the TFH are also producing, producing, expressing the CD40 ligand, CD40 ligand, which is important for licensing DC and making them potent at activating the CD8 response. They express the oxysterol, which was shown by Jason Sister and Ron German to be important in organizing DC in lymphoid organs. And they express also a high level of IL-21, IL-21 and interferon gamma IL-21, which we think is also quite, quite uh, important for activating the CD8 effector program. So with this, uh, I think we, we believe that, that in fact this organization, this niche uh, uh, or, or that formed, formed by this cellular triad that include a DC in this, in this MREC state and uh, uh, interacting with uh, CD, CD4 T cells are going to be very important to promote potentially the survival of progenitor CD8 T cells. So we think that this is really what potentially happening is that this needs to allow these progenitors to survive so that they can now receive a, a, a checkpoint blockade and differentiate following proper cues to this effector T-cell program. Now in non-responders, however, it seems that the progenitors are probably there, so priming occurred, they were recruited there, but they are either not uh, 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 seeing the proper cues to differentiate, and they will differentiate mostly in exhausted T-cells, uh, or they, they cannot differentiate. Now, wh what we don't know is how they are surviving, what are the, 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 the programs that enable them to survive. This is something that we are looking at right now. I'm not going to summarize this, because I see Alan being anxious uh, that I you know, finished this talk. This is my group, you know, engaged in our vaccine campaign. I'll read this quote, because I you know, uh, quote that we um, cherish very much. And this is uh, all the people who contributed to, uh, uh, to, this, uh, to this work. I'd like to acknowledge all my clinical collaborators and all our collaborators from Regeneron who really uh, uh, collaborated you know, fully with us throughout this study. So thank you very much.